I can come over and stand near you. <laughs> okay. Um, and um, so Kay, or Kavan Zana Zanoka, I guess, uh, is an instructional designer and an information and technology mentor for uh, Community College in Colorado. She's a PhD, stu PhD student in education at the University of Colorado, Denver, and her research focuses in on educational equity, immersion, role play, and connected learning. She is the current chair of the ISTE Games and Simulations Network and co-chair of the eLearning Consortium of Colorado. In her spare time, as we all have tons of it, of course, um, she leads and facilitates the Metagame Book Club, which combines the reading of fiction, gameplay, and education research. Um, I know she, you also are kind of one of the co-leaders of that, the Educators Wild Guild, so that's another thing as well. <laughs> <laughs> I've been on a couple of those uh, journeys. <laughs> and um, yeah, and actually, uh, she's got a lot of great videos too for folks. Um, if you look back at her stuff, she's got a good YouTube channel. I will, as soon as I get my slider moving, sure. I will get going. <laughs> no, that's fine. They can be onerous. <laughs> I'm like, please spin for me. Please spin. <laughs> like, if you and don't these, spin. <laughs> and these are a couple of links, too, for today. Um, so uh, I happened to cross rapid response. Uh, I forgot even how I got to it, and I, you know, it's an it's a I think a perfect presentation for us here at Nonprofit Commons, since we're usually focused on like serious social good uses of spaces like this, because it's a great meld of like of thinking about um, education, but also being able to kind of like focus on that sort of um, digital civic engagement and and uh, and so great stuff so once her and if I don't get this yeah I was gonna say if I don't get this just been soon <laughs> you might be doing this differently <laughs> yeah if you if you it, yeah it's up to you I can also move it if you let me but oh yeah if I uh, just set it to anyone if you for have a second yeah uh, nope okay let me play a little bit more And sorry that that I'm being such a noob. <laughs> That's all right. Hey, this time. Here we go! Yay! Okay. <laughs> Let me go back one. Okay, and I will stand by you. Sure. Okay, um, hi everybody. Um, first of all, let me ask, let me preface this, this with a couple things. How many of you, um, how many of you are instructional designers or have worked with an instructional designer? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know Lear has. <laughs> The soft Marley, the soft type. Okay, then, then, then there. The, and I have some people who know what they're talking about. I'm just tossing this up for 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 some people. This from, is from Inside Higher Ed, and it's like 61 ways to know you are talking to an instructional designer. But it really wasn't written by an instructional designer. So there's a couple things in there that I'm like, oh yeah, that's what instructional designers say to people. That's not necessarily what they believe. But um. We're kind of like at some colleges and some universities, we're kind of like the Maytag repair people <laughs> in, in the sense that sometimes people feel like we're more like tech help than, than actual, uh, than, than people who, who teach all the time, um, do training, um, know about online, know pedagogy, instructional strategies, and and all that, all that kind of stuff. Now, the reason. Now, I'm going to get to the part about um, rapid, the rapid response. And this part is going to be U.S. focused, and it's going to be political. And the reason I'm saying it's political is not because I think it's political, but I've been told <laughs> what we're doing has been political. So this started. Um, this started pretty much really, really early. Um, 
in the president uh, in President Trump's, uh, you know, administration. What happened was um, was this. The fr what happened was right after President Trump um, um, took over the White House, he came out with an executive order that, and this executive order um, banned people uh, banned people from mostly Muslim countries and North Korea. Now, we saw uh, myself and the other instructional designers. We saw everything that was happening, and we saw how the lawyers went to the airports and were helping people with migration problems. And of course, um, I'm I'm outside of Denver, and of course we could go to local protests and and carry placards and send emails and and also, you know, call our Congress people. But we started to think about what well, what is our skill set and what can and what can we do <laughs> that is part of our skill set. So what we started to what we started to do was we started to do what we called rapid response. And and I will tell you at this point in time there there are so many things happening that we're not able to get everything, but what we started to do was design resources, so design curriculum, um, make some videos, you, even even if it was come up with a come up with a meme or a reading that someone could do. We decided as these things would happen, we would start doing rapid responses. And some things we went, in, you know, some things we went into very short, giving out information, and other things we went into way into depth. Um, and I'll show you some of that. What we did design was, and again, because we're instructional designers and we're trainers, we couldn't help ourselves. We set up training. <laughs> we set up a way that you can actually use you know, anywhere from one to three weeks, and your organization or your group of educators can start can start setting setting things up so that they design. Now, in online learning, a lot of times people design their courses fully before the course even starts. And and how many people here do we have that um, that design either design or teach online courses? Mm-hmm. And and the thing about it is, depending on the organization you're at, they might want everything complete before you start teaching that semester. Other organizations, like the one that I'm at, um, instructors have to have the first two weeks everything perfect, and there's they even have people who go in and check the first two weeks. And then the, there's some um, other organizations and institutions where you're allowed to build as you go and change things up and things like that. Well, it's tilting more and more for online learning towards ha having everything completed and not adding additional components. So what we were trying to do, um, partly, was geared towards online. So that even if it was just discussion prompts for something that was happening during a week, that people would be able to, to grab what we did, or they, or they would be encouraged to see that there are other things that they can take into their courses. And the reason why, another reason why we did this is um, we often saw what we were doing copied. <laughs> so so from uh, from a kind of a moral standpoint, we went, look, um, once we start on a topic and, and we start making videos and we start putting out readings, we, we normally can count anywhere from three to six months and, and we'll see, you know, like it could just be great things and great minds think alike, or it, it might be that, you know, it's just in the air, or it might be that some people uh, copied some of our stuff over. We decided to play to that as a strength. That as instructional designers, that was another one of our strengths. <laughs> our material is often used. <laughs> and, and, you know, people do derivatives of it. And we thought it was important in, in, the, in this era for us to do this. Now, most of, most of us are in Colorado, and that's why it's the e-learning consortium of Colorado. Um, we also have friends in North Carolina, um, 
if any of you know Tanya Smedley from here from Second Life or know her as Grid Jumper, she's one of the other people who have been involved in doing this with us. But we decided we would build things and put them out and hopefully we could move people along. And I will show you some more. Okay, now this hideous looking thing <laughs> Is, is actually an instructional design model that we're working on. And if anybody wants to be a guinea pig, we're going to start writing this up so that we can send it to an institutional review board and so that we could actually start doing research. Um, don't try to look at the stuff in the middle. The stuff in the middle is an actual instructional design model for, for, uh, for rapid prototyping. But the arc on the top is, is really what we're looking at when it comes to when it comes to any of these resources, one, we're looking for culturally relative pedagogy. I'm at a community college. At my community college, um, I can tell you, um, gender, class, and race matter. Okay, my students are not privileged. They are not all white. And um, depending on what class it is, there, there is often a gender that there is often a gender imbalance. There is, there also can be a chilly climate, and there's other things that go with gender, such as a lot of, a lot of the students can be single mothers, can be the person who is the primary caregiver and the primary uh, breadwinner for the family. So when it comes to culturally relevant pedagogy. We started looking, when we started making these resources, we started to think how, who's being excluded and who did we need to include? Now, that next one, the approaches to multicultural curriculum, um, that's actually by someone, uh, a really great scholar. Um, his last name is Banks. And he has this four point model that is beautiful. And if you're trying to make your curriculum multicultural, there's four steps you can do. And depending on how much time and resources you have, you can make decisions. One, the first step is celebration. And that's like heroes and holidays. So that's like, um, that's like Hispanic, that's like Hispanic History Month, Black History Month, things like that. Okay, the second level is, the second level is additive. Oh, thank you, Marley. Yes, I, I, I would agree. I am aware of Antioch and they are great and, and you're right. And I wish I was there. <laughs> so, so what we're doing is much more of if you can't, if you can't be there and you're looking to take some steps and you're looking to, to look at what your curriculum is, what your activities are, or what you could just add to your class. So the second step, and I'll go quick, is, is an additive one. So think of it like putting an augmented reality layer onto, <laughs> onto the curriculum or to what you're doing at weekly activities. And I love that I can say augmented reality to you guys um, because everybody else, I have to say that you let's staple it on. Because <laughs> I can't say it because they don't get when I say augmented reality. But you guys can get something like that. Okay, the third step is transformative, and that's really building your curriculum with multiculturalism from the very beginning and the fourth step that's what you said Marley that's that the force of the fourth step the fourth step is decision-making and social action so the thing of it is when it comes to what, what we're building and when we're talking to people about this we tell them take whatever level you can do um, that one in the middle that's connectivism and I won't go into a lot of de details there that um, that is, is George, that is George Stephen, and go ahead and look up connectivism. You guys already do it, um, and probably a bunch of people already know it, already know what it is. So how many people here are familiar with connectivism as a learning theory? Yes, yes, Lear is. Yes, <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> so... I want to bring in connectivism when we're, we're doing all these because I don't, I want to make sure students can go beyond the resources that they have in the physical classroom. Now, 
Um, jumping over to the next one, and we're gonna, and again, going quick. This is Jenkins et al. And it's it just Google new media skills for participatory culture. He and a bunch of researchers, it's William Jenkins, um, wrote, uh, sorry, Henry Jenkins, wrote this in like 2006. And we're still not there. We are still not there. And I'm still trying to push these things into classrooms. But um, when, when we're designing the resources, we do that. <laughs> and, and last but not least, this one isn't known really well. But um, it's Social Network Knowledge Construction, and this is by Dr. Lisa Dolly at Boise State. Moved to, moved to San Diego, but I think it's the University of California, San Diego, or it could be San Diego State. But that's, that's the model, the things that we look at. And, and I don't usually show people these models when we're doing trainings or we're putting out resources. Um, but these are the things we're trying to build in. We, Try to grab at least one or two of these. To... Um, so I'll go on to the next thing. So here's some examples what we did, <laughs> and I put up some of the slides from the ones that we did, that we did like right at the very beginning. We were kind of mild when we came out. Okay, so as soon as the immigration executive order hit, we we went through. Um, we did this, we um, patched it through the e-learning consortium of Colorado and ISTE Games and Sim Network. And we went, um, let's just call it multiculturalism, social issues, and games. I will tell you now, we are very explicit when we say things. This was a very, this was a very nice one, that one that we put out. And depending on the organization, we do, we do tailor it to the audience because some of the K-12 instructors that we work with through ISTE are, are in, are in um, the southern states of the U.S. And they do have to be careful um, about how they talk about certain things. And they almost do kind of like guerrilla education where they bring, thing, where they bring things in um, that not their school board wouldn't necessarily approve if it went before. <laughs> if it went for it. Okay, so one of the, the big things that we started with, because, yeah, we're, we're worried about it, and if, and I know not everyone is from the U.S., but if you were paying attention to what's been happening at our border, um, we have detention centers, okay? So we st really started with Know Your History, and this is Korematsu um, versus the United States. And this was about the Japanese internment. So we started with there, with that, and we started spreading the word about this interactive fiction game. Now, uh, I'm gonna ask who here plays interactive fiction? And, 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 and I shouldn't say like, it, it's not like something that you do like if you're in like World of Warcraft Guild and you're, you know, like in there three times a week. It's just, it, if you occasionally play it. The, the thing about interactive fiction, interactive fiction is basically text. It's not so much images. It, most of them don't have images or sound. It can still be interactive fiction if you have, if you don't have these, but if you have these. But the thing about interactive fiction is we've been using them at my college in the classrooms and the instructor will pull this up on the whiteboard and we'll have a student read it and we'll at each point we'll have the students decide what they're doing now interactive fiction is like a choose your own adventure book and what really surprised me about this was the instructor and the students immerse really quickly but this was one of the ones that, that we that we put out, and I should say, also being from the state of uh, the state of Colorado, there was an internment camp um, in our state, and we're right by California, and we have people of of third a third generation um, Jap Japanese Americans. So in our state, there is a group of people who who this who really understand this. The next thing we're really wanting, we're really wanting our students, and we're putting out material on how do they know the, how to know the world. Oh, Marley, thank you. 
Um, so how, how do they know the world? Where can they get information that is accurate? Where can they get information that, I mean, there's a, there, there can be a bias to anything, but where can they get the most accurate information where it's likely not to be biased? So we do know the world. This is another one. Um, this is a migrant experience, again, interactive fiction. And the reason why we're going with interactive fiction is because it can be pulled up. <laughs> oh, Marley, it doesn't matter to me. I, I'm used to <laughs> I'm used to walking and chewing gum. And, and when doing like webinar um, classes with my students, I stop every time. <laughs> and just make it part of the conversation. <laughs> so don't worry about it. <laughs> so but it might, might stop you. It might annoy other people, that's what I'm saying. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, yes. You're, it, you, for the sake of other people, fine. But for me, doesn't bother me. Now, Know the World, The Migrant, is another interactive fiction. And again, I know Second Life is, you know, beautiful graphics. And it's wonderful that we can do embodiment of the avatar. But I'm finding that immersion can happen in things like this. And this is The Migrant. And while it's called an interactive fiction game, I should let you know that there's usually not a happy ending. And, <laughs> and, and there is not usually a winning scenario to these. But we're using interactive fiction a lot because instructors can go ahead and bring them into their courses. So we're finding them, curating them, and sending them out and attaching them to the different things that happen. Um, another another example of where you can find some great resources is I don't know and we didn't know this okay <laughs> to start out but a lot of the courts um, go ahead and they live stream their hearings on YouTube we had no idea so now we're included you know whenever we're dealing with one of the whenever we're dealing with a topic that we can find a live audio we always include it. And, and I will tell you, depending depending on what it is, um, we'll even go in and we'll listen and we'll find what minute something starts. So this is another area. Um, the big thing is with the three domains of learning, um, cognitive, affective, and psychomotor, we are really looking at the affective domain. We, we are really encouraging instructors to look at attitudes of awareness, interest, attention, concern, and responsibility. That, that, that's what we're looking for. Well, while, while we do want facts, we're, we're looking for more. And I'm just showing you, you an example. Um, the verdict for Philando Castillo, um, it shows up for us because this was a really big one. We had a huge discussion about, do we bring it into the classroom? This, the verdict was released on a Saturday. It was like, do we bring it into the classroom or not? And what we really did, what we really did there was with this big discussion between myself, other instructors, and some people in my doctoral program, it was really, it was determined, look, we're going to start recording social media. We're going to start recording um, Twitter when things happen so that we have references and we have a record for it and that we can use that for discussions and we can get that out to, to anybody who want who wants to use something like that and with Philando Castillo it was finally uh, one of my colleagues who said who said look students are gonna see it and if the students are gonna see it why how, how can we be moral educators and not discuss this in our classes well how can we just go back to what we already had planned for the curriculum and and I'm not saying don't align it with your don't align it with what you're doing but if it's something that you can bring up there's a lot of classes that this works for this works for communication what we did it for was communications criminal justice classes um, um, philosophy class and a political science class now this this might not work for a science you know, a, a, a straight science class. But if it's something that your students will be discussing, if it's something that, that's on their mind, if it's something that's impacting what they're learning, 
that's really what culturally responsive pedagogy is about. Some other things, um, this was something that with the Affordable Care Act, we really started talking about the American Disabilities Act and um, also about the uh, disability activists. And again, I'm outside of Denver and one of the big things in the United States when it came to um, disability activism happened in Denver. And it was doing, in Denver, our bus system is RTD. And we were one of the, we were one of the first cities where activists um, blocked the buses and, and worked towards getting our, our buses to be accessible for people with wheelchairs. And our public library has, a, our Denver Public Library has a big collection on this. So it was finding resources and letting people know where they could get resources. Um, know the world. I will tell you when it came to um, the North Dakota pipeline, what kind of surprised us is was here in Colorado, it was big. Okay, <laughs> it, it, it was big. Um, Standing at Standing Rock, it was not that far from us. And we were surprised with our East Coast colleagues who knew, who had heard nothing about this. So we actually, uh, for our resources, we went and um, drew up a resources and a cheat sheet so that they would be able to follow this through social media and know where to find it. Because when we started, when we started with this topic, um, it hadn't hit. Um, Lawrence O'Donnell on MSNBC, he started looking at it after a while, but we we were we were pushing information out um, months before he started talking about it. And um, one of the great places we go to, and I wish they didn't have to have this, but Southern Poverty Law Center, and they also do teaching for tolerance. We grab whatever resources we think are applicable, depending on it. Um, Here's the Banks model, just so you can get another peek, <laughs> peek at that. And that's how we're showing people how they can take things into their curriculum. And like we said, if it's just contributions, if you're at the lowest level, start somewhere. Okay, we've been using games as discussion prompts. Games for Change is a good, okay, Games for Change is a good place to get games. You are going to have to develop the discussion prompt and the discussion around it. You're gonna have to play the game, um, add additional material to it, because a lot of, a lot of, while their games are doing something good, it usually doesn't, it usually doesn't give the whole perspective. That's what I, I'm just gonna say. <laughs> and this is one of the ones that, that we did, again, right away, and this is when we were going very mild. Um, we are looking for our students to develop a critical conscience. Yes, so to always ask what is missing when they see something, whether it's in the mainstream or whether it's, it's in their textbook. Um, because we're dealing with like this for crazy. And I'm going a little quicker now because I don't want to take too much time. But when, um, but when Joyce said I was an information and technology literacy mentor, there's two of us at my college and we help our instructors develop assessments, activities and assessments um, for information and technology literacy. And we have found that everything that we're doing in rapid response, <laughs> um, it began earlier this year, we're bringing into the classroom. In fact, now we're doing trainings and presentations where we will bring this rapid response slide deck in and use that to show the training. And why does all of this matter? <laughs> well, it all matters because we, we want our students to understand what information is. And these are some of the slides that we just show with what is information. Like all, these po all those points, that's data. And it's data until you put it into some kind of context. And there is propaganda out there, okay? Every political party <laughs> is trying to persuade you. <laughs> There's no, <laughs> and 
they are always trying to persuade you. Now, they might be more truthful or, or less truthful about it. They might use facts and data and things like that and put in context, but pol political parties are trying to persuade you. We are seeing misinformation because people aren't checking facts. We are also seeing lots of disinformation, and this is hitting us pretty heavy as educators because what we're seeing outside of the actual school is different <laughs> than what we were telling them. And this, I never thought I would see this again in my life outside of Cold War spy novels. <laughs> But, but I am again seeing Mascaroka, and it, it, it's, and and I'm going crazy that that this is is now again being talked about. Um, a lot of librarians use the crap test, and yes, it is purposely called that so students can remember it. Because if we called it the carp test, chances are they would not remember it. Um, we think, and, and this is my colleague and I think you need to go further. Okay, and then that. An example of this is like, what is, oh, sorry, we'll go back. What is chain migration? This is actually something um, I needed to go into a classroom for. And the reason, oops, it is going a little on us. Okay, let's go back. Um, <laughs> the reason why we had to find out about immigration is because um, we have a program for teachers of English, of English as a second language, and they needed this information. And last year, it, well, it's actually this year, if they had listened to the president's um, State of the Union speech, he gave, he gave, <laughs> he, he said things that, that were not factual, especially about, um, about um, immigration. So we did a whole big rapid response on where could they find um, reliable information. And we actually went to a local immigration lawyer to get all that information and compile it and send it out. Um, some things here, this is just this is just showing some other things that we've dealt with is like where the right to the internet and where are the internet deserts are. Um, for us, it was really big. Um, in the U.S., there was a repeal of net neutrality last year. This was huge for us. We actually ended up doing over, over three hours worth of videos, and not all the same video, and they're all indexed, but over three hours worth of videos on this. Um, the lawsuit from Mozilla um, against the government is going to be taking place on February 2nd. We will be doing another one to catch everybody up to speed. But for us as educators, especially um, who do online learning and who love to bring in immersive, this was this was huge. For, uh, this was huge for us, and it continues. Um, the other thing is we did um, we did a little session on how Verizon throttled um, the fire department during the California wildfires. This was in August, and it was one of the big cases of of. Uh, the repeal of net neutrality being a problem. Uh, the other thing that we're looking at when it comes to rapid responses that we're kind of tacking on is um, the push now for open educational resources. So I'm just going to quick ask, how many of you are using open educational resources? <laughs> Lear is, and, and it's funny because, because because Lear is like a co-conspirator, so I always <laughs> expect to ask the question. Okay, if you look at your state legislature in the U.S., many of the states are encouraging the use of open educational resources. So rather than publisher textbooks, using resources that are free to use that you find either on websites or open education resource textbooks. This is, this is huge. And the reason we're pushing this is because a lot of the textbooks didn't ha don't necessarily have culturally relevant pedagogy in them. They don't have connectivism in them. They don't have um, the new media skills. They don't even talk about the new media skill sets for participatory culture. So we're really saying with 
um, the chance of all these grants being out there for open educational resources. There's a chance if you are building new resources or building a new textbook, you can start including them. Yes. I, I, I agree, Gentle, that, and, and they're easy to use and remix. And the real reason we're, we're pushing this is because we can, for the, us, those of us in the U.S., we can expand the history. We can expand who's included and who's excluded. Um, I'm working with somebody who's putting in a microbiology grant um, for open educational resources, and she is a person of color. And every picture in her current microbiology book is of somebody who is, who is white, like me, like me, and like my avatar. And in microbiology, there are lots, lots of the pictures are of, of, and yucky things. And sorry, I'm squeamish. I'm not a good person to be working with her on microbiology because I get squeamish. But all of the images are showing it on people who have white skin. And some of these things need to be on people of color because there is going to be a different look and a different appearance. So I mean, even just on this fundamental idea of what photo, what images and photographs, this is a great opportunity um, for for us to look to to photo repositories that can show us something something other than just one, <laughs> you know, one race. Oh yeah, I, I I agree, and and it comes in. That's when it, the cultural relevant pedagogy comes into it. Because think about if you were teaching a multimedia design class, or or if you were just showing your students how to do that. I mean, I I know I do that with my I help my instructors, you know, configure things, that, and and we're not talking about that. But um, thank you, Joyce. I'm gonna have to look that one out. That will look that one up. Because that's a good point. So um, this is, I'm just showing you a slide that we show when we go into a, a classroom as information and technology literacy mentors. We always tell people that it, it's a work in progress. Um, Marley, yes, please do. <laughs> and again, I am, uh, this is just tossing up the model again. It, it has, we have not done the work in the research, so we have to do the research to see if it works. And I know everything I'm talking about might be, you know, it might be a little depressing, okay? But this is something that, that one of the people doing rapid response with us, her name is Trish Cloud, she's an educator in North Carolina, and this is, you know, she sent us this meme, and for anybody who listens to the band The Clash, um, Joe Strummer was the lead singer of, of, of The Clash. Um, he, is, he has since died. This was one of his friends and from the punk band. Um, you, can, you can tell it's, this is dating me, <laughs> Black Flag. But um, his meme out there, this is not the time to be dismayed. This is punk rock time. This is what Joe Strummer trained you for. So this is, <laughs> this is what we normally <laughs> end our sessions with. That, yeah, and there we go. Okay, so thank you, thank you very much. And what we're really trying to do is we're trying to push out resources on things that are happening in these turbulent times and also help, you know, we're going, please steal what we're doing. And then we're all, what we're also saying is, if you need help, if you want to talk, if you want instructional design help, you know, um, I don't want to say we're instructional designers without borders, but we kind of, <laughs> because we're really U.S. focused at this point, um, because there's because of what's going on here. Um, but we just want to get things out, and and we think that while we can't be the lawyers at the airport, we can do something.
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, thank you very much. That's that's the that's the training site. That's it. That's like we have we have three weeks worth of training. If you want your organization to um, ramp up making these resources, we have exa we have the examples there. You can pull things down. You can mo you can go ahead and model off it. Whatever whatever you feel like doing there. Oh my gosh! <laughs> this just and and I will I will tell you we kind of triage so it it's more like if if you if you want to get involved um like we watch the news and go oh my god we have to do it on this and because we're rapid response we're kind of it, so if you're a person who likes to plan things out perfectly um we're we're not kind of that kind of group. As we see things, we're gonna do it. We know about the February second um, court date, so we absolutely know we're doing something. In you know, we'll be working on it in January to be ready to push something out. Um, but just just let us know you're interested, and as things come up, we go okay. We absolutely have to do this, and we usually do. And and I know what we put out there was that you could do a week turnaround time. We usually do a three to five day turnaround time. But anybody who wants to help us, yes. <laughs> I, I saw or somewhere along the line mention of a Discord. Is that how you guys are actually all quick communicating? Um, we put a disc we put a Discord up there just for people to see what it was like. But oh. honestly, we're communicating we're communicating by a quick email. Ah. Uh, yeah. Uh, is there um, are there certain things you charge for and other things given away for free? <laughs> no, we we don't charge for anything. <laughs> so you all earn your living in other ways. Yes. Yes, I should, okay. I should say that. And that is also one of the reasons why we're doing this. First of all, we're, we're all pretty much the 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. people, or even later. Um, and I should say we're later than that. We're, we're usually, you know, 6, and then with it, depending on commute, getting home at, at 7. So the likelihood of we can't be in, say, a, a weekday thing where we would go up at our senator's office or... Um, you know, or be at a protest downtown Denver that was happening on a Thursday. And, and I will tell you, there's, there's fewer protests in Denver on Saturdays and Sundays than there are on weekdays. So because of that, this, it, it really is, this is what we're good at. Um, and this is, and this is what we could do. Oh, abs abs yes, absolutely. Um, I should tell you, um, when I had the slide up on the information and technology literacy, um, we actually we actually use my college's um, rubric for that. It has five, um, it has five components. I'm sorry, it has six components to it, and we just quickly al align it to there. Um, like the different criteria. Our, our, our scope, ethics, <laughs> um, planning, analyzing, synthesizing. So when the students re respond to these things, they usually either have to write something back in discussion or as a small essay, as an assignment, and the alignment is to those six components. And, and I will tell you, um, at my college, for it to count as one of our, our student learning outcomes, you have to use four out of the six. So if an instructor wants to list it as, oh, 
and and our instructors are required to um, incorporate our student learning outcomes inside the classes. And I think I can look that up really quickly. You get academic credit for the work that you're doing outside of. I no, no, I don't. <laughs> Oh, we were just able. Terrible. We were just able to bring it in, <laughs> so we were already doing the rapid response, and it just and just because of the situation that's happening, um, in the country and in the in the classrooms too, the discussions that are happening, and whether they be um, face to face or whether they be um, online classes, they, um. They have to go. They have to go ahead and um, to put it in. And I will putting it in there. That is um, at my college, the student learning outcomes, and in each class, instructors are encouraged to assess all of these. There are some classes that have specific ones, and what we're doing, what we're giving the students, lines up with information and technology literacy. Now, I will tell you, the critical thinking people also jump on <laughs> to it, and that's fine. But what we were doing here, we did because this is what we could do. Like I said, um, we could have put on one of the pink hats and gone onto the protest, and I, that is totally valuable and people need to do this, but this is what we can do best. And from, from that, <laughs> what we designed, we were able to start bringing that into the classroom. Yes. So where are all these resources living that your guys are compiling? Okay, so most of the resources, um, we, put them, we put them through the Metagame Book Club. And let me pull up. Some of them are here. Others are um, others are on our YouTube channel. We could do a little better with curating. I, I will say that. Um, the others are on the YouTube channel, um, and we usually we usually push uh, we push them out on Twitter. That's where we're more likely to put them in. I, I hate to say it, push them through a lot of different <laughs> of our Twitter accounts, and they're usually pushed through. We usually put this hashtag on. Um, yes, like I said, we're more instructional designers. <laughs> and um, we put, um, because we're members of ISTE, and ISTE is the International Society of Technology and Education, uh, they have an online group that's probably 15,000 um, teachers. We push it. We push those things really quickly through those groups, and and that's what I said about doing. And we do things depending on what the topic is through a lens that someone in North Carolina in a rural school would be able to bring in the information, and not and not have and not have to worry. <laughs> I 
Nice. Yes. Yes. Yeah, and, and you may not be able to, to answer these. Now, I understand the flow going out from your group out to uh, educators and so on. I'm not as clear as about, uh, about the flow coming in. That is, things that you may not be aware of that are right up the alley of, of your uh, rapid response that other people would know about. How do you set that up? Oh, I... I, I will I will tell you we are we are not great at that. Uh because that would um, be the other arm of this that would be really beneficial. Oh, I Hey. Um, yeah. When it, when it comes to that, I I would love to, you know, for us pushing, I, I would say the flow back to us, I, we, would, we would love to hear if there was something that a group felt like they would like our help with, um, or just give us information about them because you've already collected the resources and you have the information and then we can we can start pushing you know pushing it through or incorporate or incorporating the resources in we we would be interested in that um i will tell you we are doing this not as a very formal organization we are doing it very much as a this is this is something we felt we had to do we had to get out there um, the other thing that I, I didn't put on, on there, um, we're all, we also do ethics in games. Um, and again, for, for, for the same reason, because we, we want to get things out there. And I will tell you, we're not a very form, a formal organization. And for now we're keeping it that way because that seems to work well for us. Yeah, I understand it's your form of social activism. Could you say just uh, a few sentences about your process? Like, do you divide up uh, uh, the uh, the lining up of the uh, resources according to what the uh, main interests are of the people in your group, or how do you do that? Yeah, that that's what that's what we do. What, okay. what we do, and I, I will tell you, here's our process. Uh, our process is, oh, my God, did you see that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> see, we need to do something about that. I, or I can't believe this went out. Oh, my God, people, people may not know the backstory on this. Okay. Then we start a Google slide. <laughs> we send our emails to each other. We start a Google slide. <laughs> one of us jumps on and puts like the main points of of, of yeah, and and we use, and we use black. Uh, we always use black with the white. So we use black, and somebody starts putting the main top topics in there, and then someone else jumps in and starts putting the things in there. And after about uh, twenty four to forty eight hours, it's people have decided on what they want to focus on. You know, um, we have somebody. Um, it, his avatar name is Abacus Capolini, but he he is an administrator, and he also teaches business and accounting, and he can do all things like he keeps abreast of all things technology. Chances are, he ends up being the opposing voice because <laughs> we try to keep it a little more balanced. <laughs> so he usually represents what. What does business think about this? Why is business doing this? What? Why would business interests um, even consider this? So he usually takes that part. Um, Sherry Jones, she teaches philosophy. She usually ends up on the ethics, uh, you know, the ethics side of it. Um, when when grid jumpers jumping in with us, oh, grid, she just has this. She's from K twelve. So she takes has this wonderful K twelve look at it, 
and also because um, she was at Broward County Talent Development. That was actually talent development. The coordinator was her title. She can usually take like an HR view of it. So we all kind of pick our spots and and we and we go from there. And so so that's so that's our so that's the process. Now that research uh, model that we gave you is something we it is something after we get that those parts done, we go back and we go, okay, so culturally relevant. Who who are we missing here? What's the critical consciousness? Okay, if we're if we're putting this out, are we telling people that they can put this out as a celebration piece? Do they, can they put this out as an additive piece? Can they put this out as a social action piece? Um, then then we you know for connectivism, we we always mention we always try and mention the networks and the people that they can connect to and who's already doing like activism in it, and and then. Um, we go ahead and, and try to wrap it up with um, social network knowledge construction. Like I said, um, that's from Dr. Lisa Dolly, and she's one of my professors. And we always mention that because uh, while I didn't spend time on that, it's really quick to say, um, according to that model, there's five things you do. Um, you can do one of five things. One, you can just find out about the organization online. Two, you can lurk and never you know chat and just watch the videos. Three, you can um, you can actually contribute. Um, you can create things, or you can lead things. So, so we try to go through that model before we finish up. But our process at the very beginning is like what I see in a lot of groups is kind of well. We do Google Slides. A lot of groups do a Google document and throw it up and go, "Who wants to do what?" And then you know the magic happens. Oh yes, um, I I can tell I I can tell you that that's really where we start at, and it comes because all of us besides instructional design we're all educators and we're all either you know either, we're we're pretty much all in PhD school, so we're in that mode to begin with. So what we normally do is we we look at the research. We look at the government organizations, whether they be UN, US organizations, we're a little wary of these days, but um, we still look there and, and we are, are checking the facts along the way. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. No, no, th 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 thank you for uh, thank you for that suggestion because yes, I I will tell you we are pretty much reactionary um, right now and so so far it's been working. There's no guarantee it will continue to work. <laughs> Oh, wow, thank you. <laughs> oh, my God, thank you.
No, I, I, I will tell you, we have a culturally relevant um, pedagogy exercise that my friend, who <laughs> I love her dearly, <laughs> she is a Trump supporter, um, <laughs> and we sit, and for the culturally relevant pedagogy, we have one activity, like what topics you can just pull, like what topics could you probably bring into any class to do it? We went through a list and um, we came to a consensus of what the topics would be called. And like I said, net neutrality. Net, uh, we haven't we haven't even gotten to all the net neutrality stuff yet. So expect that from us. We're we're also one of our um, people is doing it. Part of his dissertation is going to be on data justice. So we're going to be jumping in more into um, the right to the internet, data justice, and, and things like that. So I I know we're going to get deep into that. 